All right. Joshua chapter 1, a very exciting book of the Bible. I'm glad to be starting off with this book for our Wednesday night Bible study. Now, in the book of Joshua here, we'll start going, let's look through this. We're going to go through each verse and kind of preach through. Uh, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses minister saying, and then he goes on, God speaks unto Joshua here. But what I want to point out, and maybe you already saw this as we were reading through the chapter before uh, j just a few minutes ago. When it brings up Moses over and over and over again, it, it keeps mentioning Moses, the servant of the Lord, the servant of the Lord, the servant of the Lord. And God, I think, is hammering home a point here. Like Moses was a servant of the Lord. Not just that, but it's just, it, think about, because Moses is gone at this point. Moses has died. And Joshua is now taking the reins. He's taking over. He's, he's gotten in this, in this spot of leadership. He's picking up where Moses left off. Moses, because of his own sin, wasn't allowed to actually cross over into the promised land. But Moses was a great man of God and a great minister. And the fact that he's just being remembered and spoken of almost every single time his name comes up in this very first chapter, he's just called the servant of the Lord. What a great testimony to have on his life that as he's being remembered here, as he's being spoken of, he's just referred to as the servant of the Lord. That is what typified Moses' life. He's identified as just being a servant of God. Now think about your life. When the end of your life comes, how do you want to be remembered? Or is anyone going to know when they speak about you Oh, yeah, they were, they were a servant of the Lord. They actually served God. Their life was one that, that was wrapped up in serving the Lord and doing God's work. Is anyone going to know that about you? I don't know. It's something we ought to strive for. It's not, I can't think of a greater honor after passing than just being called, you know, as Abraham was called, a friend of God. And these people are just really close to God and they go down as being remembered for their work and their service for God. That's something that we ought to just not read over, but let that sink in. And that, and that our actions, and, and Moses' actions, I'm not going to preach a whole sermon on Moses, but... Um, you know, over and over again, he, he was the, the most meek man, the most humble man on the earth. And that's one of the reasons why God used him so greatly. I mean, when you talk about great people in the Bible, Moses is, is right near the top. I mean, it's hard sometimes to put a, a first, second, or third place on, on some of these great men in the Bible. But he is absolutely one of the, the best examples of, of characters we have in the Bible. Someone who's so meek and so loving in general that, you know, even when all the people were against him and wanted to kill him, he was still entreating the Lord for their sake and having that Christ-like type of an attitude or mindset that he still loved them enough and is willing to sacrifice himself in order for, for them to, to continue, or them to get right with God. Moses was a great man of God. Now, what I also want to point out here, just in verse number one, is that the Lord, it says in the, the latter half, the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. And what you're going to find all throughout Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, is that every time you have a great leader, you're going to find a great follower, a great minister, someone who is serving them before taking over lead themselves. We see Elijah and Elisha is another great example of this. You have Moses and Joshua. So every one of these great leaders has a, a, a very solid right-hand man, if you will, someone who's serving and ministering to all their needs and everything that they had. Elisha even had Gehazi for a while until there was, you know, evil just found in Gehazi and he kind of ruined it for himself. He ended up going after filthy lucre instead of continuing on to learn from Elisha. And we find Gehazi later on in life, he's just kind of reliving these old stories, telling the king all the things that Elisha did when he could have been the next one carrying the torch and standing strong for the faith. And if you want to do really great works for the Lord, you have to learn first to get the mindset of a minister of someone who is willing to take order, someone who's willing to serve. Because even Moses, who was a great leader, leading the children of Israel through, out of Egypt, confronting Pharaoh, you know, going through the wilderness, giving them the law, being a great judge, how is he known as a servant? He's a servant of the Lord. 
And what we see Joshua now is transitioning from kind of being Moses' servant to directly being a servant of the Lord. Now, obviously, anybody who serves, you know, even if, when he's serving Moses, he's still being a servant of the Lord. But even in the, the great positions of leadership, the reason why it's so important as you're learning, as you're studying, as you're growing to become a minister, to have this mindset is because to really to serve God, you have to be totally humble and um, just ready to do whatever it is that God has for you to do. And one of the ways to learn that is by getting under the leadership of a great man of God like Moses and, uh, and learn how to just kind of be in the background, take orders, and just do whatever uh, needs to be done. Obviously, only in the Lord. When it, when it comes to things, we don't, we don't worship man or serve man to the point to where, well, whatever the man says, you know, that's the gospel. But um, there's still a lot to learn by great leaders. And Moses had a great follower, a great minister in Joshua. And then when the time came, Joshua was lifted up because he didn't lift himself up. He was brought to a place of honor through all of his years of hard work and service. Uh, same way with Elisha and same way with many others in the Bible. Let's keep reading here. Verse number two. Moses, my servant, is dead. This is the Lord speaking now. He's speaking to Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. What a great promise here, too. We see Joshua receiving instruction from the Lord to go in, and, and what they're doing is they're conquering the land. Now they're going to receive that promised land, the land that was promised to Abraham, the land, the land that was promised unto Isaac and to Jacob, the land that was promised ultimately even to the descendants there of the children of Israel. The, this land was promised by God. It was promised to Moses. Moses, and now Joshua is receiving the promise as well to bring them into this land so that God's going to fulfill his word. Why? Because God's word never returns void. Everything that God says can and will uh, come to pass, and, and there's no doubt in God's words. But what I also want to point out is he's speaking directly to Joshua here. So like in verse number five, it says, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Yeah. And that is, a, that is a promise specifically for Joshua. He's saying, Joshua, you're going to be leading this people and no one's going to be able to stand before you because I'm with you, because the Lord is with you, that I'm going to be there to fight your battles for you. I'm going to fulfill my promises. And where I'm going with this is that there's a lot of people that believe and teach that these promises that were made unto Abraham and the promises that were made about the, the, the children of Israel going into inheriting a land that those promises somehow were supposed to last forever and they're eternal and that they'll always just have that land. And that's a false teaching. We see, um, you know, when God was blessing Abraham, he says that in blessing I will bless thee and cursing, you know, in blessing I will bless thee. And he says, or excuse me, those that bless thee will I bless and those that curse thee will I curse. And I know I'm not quoting it exactly right right now, but um, he uses the word thee, it's singular. And we see here another singular form being used with Joshua because it's obvious that the Lord is not always with the children of Israel. It's not something that he's always defending them. It's only when they are choosing to serve him and when they look to the Lord as their God, that is when he is going to be with them and the power of God is going to be with them to win their battles. But when they forsake the Lord, when they turn away from God, when they turn to the idols, He's no longer with them. He takes them out of their land. And we see that happen. I mean, that, that's history. It's exactly what happened. They were taken out of the land. And we don't believe that any physical seed of Abraham now has any, you know, right inherently to a land when they're not turning to the Lord, when the God is not their God, because they're not going to receive the, the promises of faithful Abraham. The reason why Abraham received those promises is because of his faith. That's the whole point. 
He's, a, he's known as a father of faith. That is, that is why God even made promises to begin with is because of his faith. And today, the people of the Lord, the people who are known as God's people or the elect are those that are believers, those that have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So um, anyways, I'm not going to get all into that. That's a whole nother topic for another day. But I'm just pointing out here that as God is, is instructing Joshua, he's saying, hey, like, I'm going to be with you all the days of your life. And while you're around, while you're leading this people, you know, I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to forsake you. I will be there for you. And man, what a, what a great promise to give you, to build up some confidence. Right? Think about the, the difficult task that Joshua is facing going into the strange land. And we know that there were giants in the land. We know that there was a lot of very strong people inhabiting the land. That's why the children of Israel got in trouble to begin with. Because all of the other spies other than Joshua and Caleb came back and said, Yeah, the land's real good, but there's no way we could beat these people. They're way too tough for us. They're way too strong. And they didn't have faith in God. Whereas Joshua and Caleb were like, hey, the Lord's with us. Let's go. Let's say, you know, he's given us this land. But it is a, a, a physically or humanly speaking, a very difficult task when you're, you know, now Joshua's in charge and he's going to be heading it up. I'm sure there's got to be just from his human aspect, some type of doubts going, man, how are we going to do this? You know, organizing a battle and God's telling them, you know what? I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'll be with you all your days. What a confidence boost that is. What, what an uh, exciting time to be part for God to say, hey, I'm with you. Let's go in, go in, send the troops. This land is yours. I'm not going to fail my word. Go in and do it. But we have promises of God as well. We know that the Lord won't leave us or forsake us. We know that God is faithful to his words. So any words that you find in this book, in this Bible, that's applicable to believers, you can take that to the bank. That's why, I mean, for example, we take our eternal life. We know that our salvation is a free gift that's given by God. We can take that to the bank. We trust in that wholly with our, with our entire heart. We have no doubt over that. We know that it's not of our works. We know it has nothing to do with that because... God has promised and he cannot go back on his word. When God says something lasts forever, it lasts forever. It's eternal. Let's keep reading here. Let's, uh, verse number six, the Bible says, Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Verse number seven, Only be thou strong and very courageous. So the Lord is really edifying Joshua. He's trying to build him up. He's trying to get him motivated and saying, look, you need to be strong. You need to have courage. You need to be very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. Isn't that interesting? Because I was just talking about how difficult it might be thinking about going in and, and you know, defeating all these other armies, defeating the inhabitants of the land. Did he tell them to be strong and courageous to go defeat the enemy? No, he said, be strong and courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. He said, you need to be strong and you need to have courage. You need to be bold in the law of the Lord. You can't back down. You can't compromise from my word. He said, you need to be strong and steadfast in my word. Keep that as your light. Keep that as the most important thing and, and be strong about it. He says, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. You need to be strong and have courage to observe God's laws. We are called in the Bible to be a peculiar people. Peculiar means different or going to be strange. If you actually decide to live your life of one where you're following God's word, you are going to be different than other people in the world. You ought to be. I mean, if you really are following the Bible and, and really loving God's law and trying to live your life in a way that, is, that coincides with God's word and getting sin out of your life and having nothing to do with wickedness and sinfulness, you're going to be looked on as different. And because you'll be looked on as different, you need to be strong. You need to have courage and the faith knowing that, no, what I'm doing is right. It doesn't matter how many people criticize you and ostracize you and make fun of you. Oh, you know, people come in, oh, you don't, you don't have a TV in your house, or you don't watch TV, you don't, you don't go to the movies, you don't listen to this music or that music. You don't, you know, people will mock you and ridicule you and make fun of you. 
And we hear it all the time with, you know, just with how many children we have. We only have five children. I don't think, I don't think that's a lot. You know, the world today is just like, oh man, you've got five. You know, are these all yours? You would, don't you know, don't you know where that comes from? Don't you know how they're made? Don't you know, you know, it's like all the comments. I mean, just, just, it's like time after time. Thankfully, I don't have to receive the brunt of it that much. My wife gets it all the time. I don't know why they don't, they don't say the nasty things much when I'm out, but you know what? It's fine. It's something you have to deal with. It's part of life. But we have to expect it and, uh, and just have the courage and not let, not let the world bring you down. And my wife especially needs to not have, you know, just all these kind of, oh, I don't want to have any more kids because I just keep hearing it and hearing it and hearing it over and over again. No, be strong. Be courageous. And she's not like that. Thank God. I mean, we love our kids. We love every single one of them. And we love the one that's on the way because we're not stopping until God stops and closes up the womb. We believe that God is the one who gives life. God is the one who determines whether or not um, he's going to bless you with a child or not. And the Bible says that children are a heritage of the Lord and that as arrows are in a... In a, in a quiver of a mighty man so are children of the youth and that they're a blessing from God and um, you know of course the world's gonna be backwards on all this stuff but we need to expect that and when you decide and that's just one example there's, there's so many different examples you know um, I, I don't know how many times I was made fun of for let's see from when I first got saved is people making fun of me because oh you don't believe evolution's true you know, you, you believe that book, you believe the book of Genesis, or it talks about God making the world, and he just speaks it, and it's there. It's like, yeah, you know, people might make fun of you for that. I do believe that. I do believe it's God's word. I'm not going to back down on that. To later on in life, when I got right with God, not drinking alcohol, and have anything to do with it, oh, you don't, oh, <laughs> what, are you, what are you, some kind of fuddy daddy, or whatever, you don't know how to have a good time? No, I do know how to have a good time. That's why I'm not drinking. Because I don't need alcohol to go out and have a good time. <laughs> Because there's way better blessings than going out and getting inebriated and letting your heart utter perverse things and let your eyes behold strange women and just getting into more filthiness and wickedness and, and problems. That's all it's going to bring you. But no, when you decide to live a sold out life for the Lord, people are going to look at you different. You're going to look as being peculiar. And as God's telling Joshua here, hey, be strong. Have some courage that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. You see, keep all of it. Don't, don't leave any of it out. We need to observe all of God's laws. And look at verse number eight. He follows it up with this. This book of the law, he like double down, doubles down on, on, the, on this uh, concept here. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Now it's a commandment. He's not just saying, you know, um, as a suggestion or as the best thing for you to do in your life, he's saying, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. This is what he's expecting out of Joshua. I expect you to have this book of the law in your mouth and you need to know it, you need to meditate on it, and you need to make sure that it is in your lips all the days of your life. He says, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Now here's a challenge for you. How often are you looking and reading through your Bible? He says day and night. And I'm going to take this as a challenge personally as well. Because there's days that I don't get in my Bible day and night. But he's telling Joshua, you need to be in the Word day and night. I mean, there's sometimes I'm only reading at night. We need to, but we take this up with Joshua's, uh, Joshua's being commanded from the Lord. Hey, you need to meditate in God's Word day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You want to be a, have a successful life? I mean, who doesn't want to be a success story? Moses was a success story. I want to be a success story. Well, the world's going to tell you, you know, you know what the world's going to tell you if you want to be a success? They're going to tell you how to make money. All about money. You need to invest in this and you need to work, th do this, work five jobs and build all this money and have all these things and have multiple houses. Then you'll be looked on as a success. I don't look on that as success. It's all going to be burned up. And then who's this going to be? Someone's going to come in and steal it. Someone's, you know, it's, it's, it's going to go away. It's going to break. It's going to be worthless. It's vanity. It's empty. You want to have good success 
meditate in God's words. And the, and the, the point of meditating, what does it mean to meditate? You're thinking about it. You don't just check off on the calendar, yeah, I read through my chapter today. You had to say, no, you have, you're thinking about it. You need to consume God's Word. You need to read it with understanding. You need to get in the Word day and night. Think about it. Meditate on it. Chew on it. Know it so that it's in your mind and in your mouth and in your heart. Because the only way you're going to be able to obey God and follow God and follow the Lord is when you know what His Word says. There's way too many ignorant Christians out there today. And when I say Christians, I'm even talking about believers, people who are actually saved, who know that salvation is by grace through faith, who aren't trusting in their works. They're only trusting what Jesus Christ did for them. They, they know that it's eternal. They can't lose it. And there's so many ignorant Christians out there. They're not getting in the Word of God. And you know what? Their life is not going to be a success. Not in the eyes of God. Because the way that he says right here for you to be prosperous, and when he says prosperous, he's not talking about finances. We can look at Jesus. Was Jesus Christ prosperous? Would anyone say that he wasn't? Because I'd say that his path was very prosperous. Did he have this world's riches or goods? No. He was homeless. He traveled about and just stayed wherever he could and lived off of whatever he found. And, and you know, God blessed his work. God sustained him and kept him going. He didn't have, he didn't die with this world's riches and goods, yet he was the most prosperous man ever to walk the earth. The greatest success story. And you know what that is a success. The haters of God talk about Jesus Christ as a failure. Because he died on the cross, because he was crucified and he was shamefully entreated. There's even a, you know, I'm going I'm to get on this. I don't know if I've ever done this before, uh, this specific point. I used to be a big Metallica fan growing up. My number one favorite band. Okay, and I'm going to get on this for just a minute because it's important. All right, and, and I, know, I know what it's like to be a believer and want to overlook some things and just not want to deal with some stuff just because your flesh likes the music. All right, but the world's music is garbage. It's trash. And we ought not to love the things of the world. And specifically, I'm bringing up Metallica because I know a lot about them. And I know a lot about their music. And they have a song that's called The God That Failed. The God That Failed. Jesus Christ is looked on as a failure in the God-hating eyes of, of many musicians and people out there that are putting out this music and say, you know, when they put out garbage like that, how can you listen to anything else they have? They say, oh, but this song doesn't talk about... Yeah, but this is what's coming out of their heart. This is what's, what they're producing, what they're putting out. Just like Nine Inch Nails. You know what Nine Inch Nails is even talking about? The nails? Some of the nails that went into Jesus Christ's hands, his feet. Talk about blasphemous. They have a song called Heresy. It says, your God is dead and no one cares. If there's a hell, I'll see you there. Yeah, is that who you want to be listening to? But they call Jesus Christ his big failure. He wasn't a failure. We know the story. We know why he endured the suffering and the shame because it was out of love for you. If he didn't do all that stuff, if he didn't suffer the shame, if he didn't allow himself to be beaten and spit upon and buffeted and, and whipped and shed his blood and die on that cross and have his soul go to hell, then your sins couldn't have been atoned for. He did it for you. I'd say that's a success. When one man gives his life to save a multitude so that anybody can receive salvation. That's a success story. Don't get caught up in this world's garbage. It will influence you. You think it won't. And this wasn't even in my notes at all. But, but you know what? If you're sitting here today, I don't know if anybody has this problem. But you know what? If you do, you need to get right with God. Because that music is wicked. It is, it is of Satan. It literally is satanic. And you know what? I've heard all the excuses before. I used to give the excuses myself. 
I remember telling my mom back when I was young, trying to tell her, oh, no, no, this is good. They actually talk about Jesus. There's a song called Creeping Death, and it talks about basically when the death angel came and killed the firstborn son in the land of Egypt. And like, that's what that song's about. It's from a very dark perspective, though. It's wicked. Don't let that, mute, don't, don't let that garbage get into your ears because it will influence you. It will corrupt you, and you will not be successful listening to that junk. You want to have good success? Try meditating in God's Word day and night. Think about it. You, you know, we all have different times to, to do things, and if you're just pumping your ears full of worldly music, and I did this for years, I know firsthand. You think about those things later on. I can't tell you how many full-length albums, we call them albums now, CDs, whatever you call them, <laughs> that I have like lyrics just, just in my head. And you know what? I can't get rid of them. It's a curse. I go out to eat somewhere, you go out to, to a restaurant, you go out to, you know, the, the music's still just being played, and it's the same stuff from the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, and just keep on playing it over and over and over, and just hammering it into your heads. And I couldn't get rid of this stuff now, even though I want to, just out of my head. Now, thankfully, you know, the, the more you get away from it, the less you think about these things, but you memorize it, it sticks in your head, and the message is there. Do you really want to continue to let that stuff just get pumped in your mind as opposed to forsaking that and replacing it with God's Word and start getting that pumped in your ears? You know, what I do now, instead of where I used to drive in my car and turn on the radio and crank it and, you know, blare that and, you know, feel good, whatever, and just, just go about with life not caring... Now I get Alexander Scorby on, on the audio Bible and get that going in my ears. Or listen to some good hymns, if nothing else. But I mean, get God's Word. We could meditate on it. And you know what? I, have, I don't have them with me. If you want an audio Bible, I've got one for you. I've got plenty. I brought some extra copies. Let me know today. I'll bring it on Sunday. I've got these DVDs that come in with the, the whole MP3s of all of uh, the whole Bible. You get the whole Bible on audio. You play that in your car. Play that in your headset. Whatever, whatever it is that you use to listen to music normally, the world's music, replace that with God's Word. You will become a success in God's eyes, which is what really matters anyways. The world's going to look down on you for that. They're going to think you're weird. They already think I'm weird. It's okay. You'll, be in, you'll, you'll at least have me for company. If they start thinking you're weird, just come on in, join the club, because been there, done that. People, you know, I don't know what people think sometimes if I ever have the windows rolled down or listening to, to Alexander Scorby talk, you know, read from the Bible. Whatever. I don't care. It doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter. You know what matters? What God thinks. And if you want to have good success, you're going to look at the law of the Lord day and night. What we also learn from this is that the laws of the Lord are for our benefit. He says, you know, that way you're going to make your way prosperous. You're going to make your path prosperous. You're going to, you're going to have good success. It, that, that's what we all want to have. We want to be prosperous. We have good success. God's rules or laws are for our problem. We shouldn't look at God's rules as something that says, oh, God, God doesn't want me to have any fun. Oh, you mean I can't do this? I can't do just a big rule book? I can't do all this stuff that I want to do? Well, the reason why God said not to do it is because it's actually going to hurt you. You know, my children might want to eat ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And be like, well, what's the big deal? You know, I just want, I just want to have this ice cream. I, why can't I just do this? Why do you have to have these rules against me eating ice cream all the time? Well, it's for their own benefit. <laughs> Anyone with two brain cells can figure that out. Uh, I mean, kids don't always get that. But, you know, as adults, you know a lot more. You have a lot more wisdom and understanding and say, no, your body actually needs nutrition. Otherwise, you're going to get sick. You're going to be ill all the time. You're not going to be having any fun at all. You'll be vomiting because all you're going to be consuming is sugar. It's not good for you, and it's not the way we're, we're made to work. Well, just as much as we know so much more than our children, God knows so much more than us. 
And in His profound wisdom, He's given us instructions and rules which says, don't do this. And it doesn't matter if you don't understand it. Just as much, it doesn't matter if my children understand it. They at least can understand it's mom and dad love me. It's for my benefit, so I'm going to listen to them. And that's the attitude we ought to have with God. You don't always have to understand why God has certain rules in the Bible, certain commands, but we ought to just trust in God that His rules are there for a very good reason, whether we understand that or not. Turn if you keep your place here in Joshua, I want you to turn to Psalm 1 because this is actually a very important point. This is what I'm going to be highlighting the most of the sermon tonight is just God's word and the law of the Lord being so important. Because what else are we hearing today from modern Christianity is this kind of forsaking of God's law and people that teach that, well, we're free from the law. Right? We're free in grace. Now, obviously, the, those words, there's truth to that. When it's applied properly, as in, we're free from the curse of the law through Jesus Christ. Amen. We can't work our way to heaven. We, there's no way that any amount of obedience to God's law is going to get us saved. Yes, we, we do have grace. Yes, we are free in that regard. But the Bible also says that we're not to sin. The Bible says that, you know, this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. If there is just no more law in the New Testament, then that means that there is no more sin, because sin is the transgression of the law. So it would be impossible for people even to be a sinner if there just is no law. No, of course there's a law. We just don't get saved by following the law. So be careful with the way that these people want to teach the Bible and say, oh, no, yeah, you don't have to worry about the law anymore. No, we do have to worry about the law. Obviously, there's been a few changes. We're not offering, you know, a physical animal sacrifice because there's been a change in the law in the regard of, of how we worship the Lord and the, the Levitical priesthood. But when it comes to all the thou shalt and thou shalt nots, that hasn't changed. When we're talking about the way that God views sin, when we talk about, you know, rape and murder and lying and all these other things still being, you know, God still hates those things. These moral laws, if you want to kind of group them together like that, anything that has to do with right and wrong, they all are still in effect. But people want to throw out the book, throw out the Old Testament laws because they don't jive with, with modern society and modern culture. The, the, the big one, these days especially, is homosexuality because churches don't know how to deal with this. And when someone like me says, hey, God knows how to deal with this because He's given us His law. In Leviticus, he's given us the law. He tells us what he thinks about this. When the Bible says that if a man lies with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them shall be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. That's how God views sodomy. That's the way that God feels about it. And you know how you would know that? If you're meditating in God's law day and night, you would know that too. As opposed to just listening to this world and, and, and getting brainwashed into saying, oh, it's an alternative lifestyle. Oh, everybody welcome. Everyone come in. We're just going to, you know, everything's just fine. We're going to not look at any sin. We're not going to call anything out. Everybody's good. Everything's fine. Hell's not that hot. No. If we want to know what God thinks, if we want to have good success, we're going to look at the law of the Lord and we're going to meditate therein day and night. I had you look at Psalm chapter 1. We're going to go through uh, multiple Psalms and we're going to see just this, the amount of weight and importance that's given to God's law. Because we cannot understate this. We need to know God's laws. We need to know how God views things so that we can have the right mindset, the right outlook on everything, on morality, on right and wrong. We get it from God's Word. 
Not man's opinion. And look, if God said putting a sodomite to death is a righteous judgment, then it's a righteous judgment. I'm not going to be the one to judge God and say God's wrong. If God says that if a man forces a woman, she ought to be put to death, amen, God's right, again. If God says that someone that steals a person, a man-stealer, a kidnapper, to put it in modern, modern terms, ought to be put to death, Amen. God is right again. God's judgments are righteous and true. And it's people who mess it up and think that they know more than God. No, 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 no. We can't be doing that. That's archaic. You want to regress? Yeah, I do want to. I want to regress to the old times, to the, to the old timeless path. Because God's word is, has always existed. And this is the right way. I don't care if it's old. You call it whatever you want. I call it God's word. And that's what I'm trusting in. Psalm 1, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, blessed is the man. We remember just talking about, we just saw in Joshua 1.8 about having good success. Psalm 1, 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, he actually likes it, is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. You want to be blessed? Start loving God's word, loving God's law. Don't look at it as, oh man, God's law is so boring. Oh, I don't want to read that. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. You ought to love that to know where you're in error with God so you can fix it and get right with them and be even more blessed and be successful. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord and he meditates day and night, verse number three, and shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Meditating in God's word, day and night, knowing God's law is going to make you fruitful. It's going to make you prosperous. It's going to make you solid and firm like this tree that's planted by rivers. Very well watered. Very solid. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse number 7. Psalm 19, verse number 7, the Bible reads, The law of the Lord is perfect. It's perfect. There's no flaws in God's law. It is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. You know that people aren't going to get saved if they don't realize that they're a sinner. If you don't realize that you need a Savior, if you don't realize that you actually have a problem with God, then you're not going to get saved. And you know how people know that they're not right with God? It's through God's law. It's by knowing that they're a sinner because they've broken God's laws. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. People need to hear about God's laws a lot more. There'll be a lot more conviction going on. There's a lot more preaching on God's laws Instead of just, oh, don't worry about the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now. We don't, we don't need God's laws. You're not going to be very successful if you're saved living a life like that. Let's keep reading here in Psalm 19, verse number 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, also sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. You ask yourself how much you would invest and devote of your time if someone told you how to achieve a, finding a lot of gold. How much of your life would you let that consume? Let's say someone gave you a treasure map, right? It may sound a little silly, but let's say there was some credence to it. There was some, some reason to believe, no, this is actually, this is legitimate. Wherever they found it, you, there's, there's this map. And if you find this treasure, 
it's going to be just wealth untold. A lot of people would probably give up everything to go and seek after that treasure. But the Bible is explaining to us we've got something already that's way better than those physical riches that you would be so willing to give up of your time and your energy and your life to go and seek after. And it's right here. And it's going to do you so much more good than that gold or that silver will ever do you. And will make you a success story if you can just meditate in God's Word. Just receive this. This is more to be desired than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Verse number 11. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them there is great reward. The great reward is not the gold and the silver. The great reward is to come. You will be rewarded for following God's word, for doing what God has for you. You just can't see it right now. Not physically. But as we we're talking about the sureness of God's word, it doesn't fail. Well, all the promises that God has made about the rewards that we receive from following His Word, they are going to come true. You just have to have faith. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 119. And don't worry, we're not going to read all of Psalm 119. But if you read Psalm you ought to. Go home and read all of Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the whole Bible, for those of you that don't know. It's a long chapter in the Bible. But Psalm 119 is literally all about the law of the Lord. All about the statutes and the judgments and the law. The whole chapter. 176 verses. All about God's law. That ought to tell us something. When we look at the longest, the longest chapter in the Bible. About God's law. I think it's important. And we're going to get some, some of the added importance just from reading some of these verses. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Again, we're talking about being blessed. We're talking about having good success. God's blessing in your life when you're undefiled. How are you going to be undefiled? When you know what's right and wrong. When you know what God's law is, then you know what the right choice is to make. And then you can do what's right. Verse number two, blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. His precepts are just his rules, his laws. There's so many words that the Bible uses in Psalm 119 to basically talk about essentially the same thing. His laws, his testimonies, his commandments, his precepts, it's all talking about the Word of God, talking about God's laws. Look at verse number uh, 5. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed. What a horrible feeling to be ashamed. I'm sure we all have experience with that when you, when you just do something that's just really shameful and you regret. You can sympathize with Peter a little bit so, you know, when he denied Jesus. And he just went out and he wept bitterly. What a low point in life to do something that you just feel ashamed of. But he's saying, oh, if I could keep God's ways, then I'll never be ashamed. What a great feeling it is to go to bed at night and to put your head down knowing that you're not just in just all kinds of sin, that you're doing your best, you're, you know, you've, you're cleaning up your life, you're doing what's right, you're serving God, and you're not ashamed. That is where we want to be. He says, says, Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. How are you going to know his commandments if you're not meditating there in day and night? And when you're respecting God's commandments, you're actually obeying them. Verse number 7, I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Jump down to verse number 97 because as we saw in Joshua, he talks about meditating in God's word. We saw in Psalm 1, talk about meditating in God's word. Well, Psalm 119, sorry, verse number 97 
Bible reads, Oh, how, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. Do you want to be smart? you want to gain wisdom and knowledge? Meditate in the law of the Lord. God's word is going to make you smart. He says, you made me smarter than my enemies. Wiser. More understanding. Verse number 99. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. Why does he have more understanding than all of his teachers? People are supposed to have a lot of knowledge in teaching him. Why does he know so much more? Why? Because he's, he's meditating and just studying God's word. Because that is the unadulterated truth and light. Verse number 100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Now, you may not have this level of love for God's law and for God's word in your life. I understand that. There is a level of growth. But what you ought to be able to recognize tonight is to be able to look at God's word and see how these words are being used about God's word being sweet to my taste, sweeter than honey, and how valuable it is and how great it is and say, well, I don't feel that way when I go home and read my Bible, but I could trust that this is true and I'm going to force myself to read and study a little bit more and meditate a little bit more until I get to this point to where I actually feel like, man, God's word is great. It's amazing. It's sweet like honey to my mouth. I love meditating the law of the Lord because it will happen. But you have to maintain the faith just to even get to that point. And, and sometimes it does become something you force yourself to do. Okay, I've done it. I love hearing God's word now. Now, still, I still have the flesh, and I'm not. Look, I have not arrived, so please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this to try to elevate myself and say, "Oh, I'm this awesome Christian," because I still have the flesh that wants to not ever listen to God's word. But in my own spiritual growth, there are way more times when I didn't want to listen to God's word, and it was more of a chore to actually read and to do it. But as time went on. And I continue to try to maintain a schedule in making sure that I'm, that I'm doing this because I know it's important. It actually becomes more enjoyable and you actually appreciate it more. And you start understanding more and you learn more and it grows and builds on itself. And it will do that. So if you're at the place where you just feel like, I don't see how that's ever going to happen, just have a little bit of faith. And trust these words that we're reading from God's word. That it is true. And it will come true. And it will make you wise. And it can make you wiser than your teachers. If you are meditating in God's word and, and treat them as being very, very valuable. Turn back, if you would, to Joshua chapter 1. In Joshua chapter 1, this is my, the biggest takeaway from this whole chapter is just having this great success, meditating in God's Word, making that be your light, making that be a, a, very, a very solid priority in your life. Let's keep going here. Look at verse number 9. Now we're going to see another phrase that's repeated. Verse number 9, he says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. We just read that a couple of verses ago in this chapter. Be strong and of a good courage. God is still trying to encourage him. And, and again, reiterate, you need to be strong. You need to be motivated. You need to have good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. When you get your heart right, and you start following that up with actions of meditating on Scripture, do, getting sin out of your life. You're going to be walking in the Spirit that much more and you have, you, you'll get the confidence and the comfort of walking in the Spirit and having the fruit of the Spirit with His love, joy, peace, 
gentleness, goodness, faith. These are all fruits of the Spirit that you receive that are going to come forth in your own life because you're walking in the Spirit. And when you're doing what God wants you to do, you're walking in the Spirit. So by meditating on Scripture, by doing these things, you gain that extra added peace. Maybe, maybe your life is full of turmoil. And you have a lot of stress and anxiety and, and just, you're not at peace. Get in God's Word and try, just try it out. Try it for yourself. I don't see how that's going to help me. i got too many other things going on. Try it for yourself. Take the challenge of God's Word. I guarantee you it won't fail. But give it an honest shot. Don't read for one night and just be like, oh, it didn't do anything for me. Forget it. That's not how it works. Be strong. Be of a good courage. Consume God's Word. Get in the Word. And then you'll get the comfort of knowing, hey, God's with me. I've had people, family members and other people ask me before, you know, especially when I went to the Soul Winning Conference in Detroit. This year, earlier in the year, there was a, there was a big conference held in Detroit, Michigan. It was a Soul Winning Conference, and there was a lot of soul winning being done. That was a great thing. It wasn't just preaching on soul winning. It was actually boots on the ground getting the work done. It was awesome. It was a great event. I took my daughter with me. My oldest daughter came with me, and we went out to the ghettos. And I'll tell you what, it was something else. It was, it was actually unlike any other place I've ever been soul winning before. I've been soul winning in ghettos before. I've been soul winning in, in poverty-stricken areas. And we went out here, it literally looked like a war zone. No joke. I've got a picture of my phone, I'll show you after service. I took a selfie with my daughter and I because the, the devastation is so bad economically in Detroit that there's just buildings that have just gone abandoned and you've got these big brick structures like multi-family housing and all this stuff, and they're in crumbles and debris and everything. I mean, it literally looks like a third world country. And we're going out and trying to knock on doors, and, and the vast majority of them are vacant and just, just left to rot. In a very bad area, a very poor area, you see you know, drug paraphernalia and stuff just out on the street, and, and just not, not the safest of places, I'm sure, to be in. But you know what? I wasn't worried, not for one second. Because what we were doing is what God told us to do. God told us to preach the gospel to every creature. When we're going out and bringing the word of God, and we're going up to people in love and trying to show them how they can be saved, you have no reason to worry about your safety or anything else for that matter. If anything is to happen when you're going out and serving the Lord, I'm going to say that's of God because I know that God's able to protect me from anything. There is nothing too, too, too hard for the Lord. Nothing. If He allows something to happen, then so be it. I'm in the will of God. But I have no reason to fear. None at all. And people ask, oh, don't you afraid of your family? And say, no, I'm not afraid. Not going to be afraid. And no one's ever going to make me afraid to serve God because, hey, if God be for us, who could be against us? And I know if I'm doing what God said to do that I'm right with God and that God will be with me. And there's no reason to fear. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. For the Lord thy God is with thee. That's what God told Joshua. And that's why I said, look, you just need to meditate on my words. Do this and you're going to be good. I will be with you the whole time for, for the rest of your life. And if you decide to serve God and get in His Word and start listening and have respect unto God's commandments and do them, you will also have no reason to fear. You'll have comfort. You'll have peace. Let's finish up this chapter. Verse number 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the hosts, and command the people, saying, Prepare you vittles, for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land when, which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. So he's saying, Get prepared. You know, in three days we're going we're gonna to go over the river. We're going to start just, just entering. We're going to start the fight. And you're going to inherit the land. 
Vittles is just, you know, like food and rations and stuff like that. You're going to bring your supplies with you, and we're going to get ready. We're going to pass over Jordan. And verse number 12, it says, And to the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest, that hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed all the mighty men of valor and help them until the Lord have given your brethren rest as he hath given you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then ye shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side Jordan toward the sun rising. So basically he's just starting off with keeping Moses' commandment. He might have been a little bit more popular with some of the people there with the... Um, the Reubenites, the Gadites, half the tribe of Manasseh, if he would have just said, oh yeah, you guys could just, you, you've already got your possession, you can stay here, we're going to go over and fight. That would have made him popular in their eyes. But no, he's saying this, this is, this weird, these were the rules. Because they got their possession when they defeated Og, king of Bashan, and you know, the kings that were there on that side, before they even got to the promised land, they're like, hey God, you know, they defeated these people that came out against them, so now they have that land, they're like, can we just have this for our inheritance? Like, we like this land, it's good for cattle, we, you know, we're, we're content with this, this is good. We don't need to go all the way over in the promised land. And the deal was, okay, you, you can have this land, but you can't just hang back and let your brethren go and, and fight all the battles. He says, you still need to go and help them out. And sure, you could have this land. You could come back after all the fighting's over. You help them out. Then you could come back. So Joshua basically in this segment, he's just, he's just keeping that. He's just keeping to those words to a T saying, nope, this was the deal. You guys, you got this land, but you have to come over and fight with your brethren. And then you could go back and then you could have your rest. So he's keeping up with that promise. He's being a good leader and sticking with the words of Moses. Um, Verse number 16 says, And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. So he's got the respect. He's going to lead them. Just as, as Moses had the respect, you know, he's got the people's respect here, and, and they've accepted Joshua as being their leader. Verse number 17, According as we hearken unto Moses in all things. And, and it, it, it's almost kind of funny because if, when you read the Bible, like the people didn't always follow Moses in all things, right? I mean, how many times were they against Moses? So I, if I were Joshua, I'd be kind of thinking like, oh, great, the way that you listen to Moses, you're listening to me. I don't know if that's good or bad, but <laughs> at this point, their heart's right. You know, they're ready to go. The, 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 the previous generation has already passed. That's why they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. The people who really just didn't have their hearts right with God. The younger generation's here. They're ready to follow Joshua. He says, according as we've hearkened to Moses in all things, so we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Verse number 18, whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. So there we see those words again. Be strong and of a good courage. Another theme in this chapter, multiple times. Be strong. There's a battle that's getting underway in Joshua. We've got a spiritual battle that's already underway. We need to be strong. That's why we're here. Keep coming to Stronghold Baptist Church. We'll help you get strong if you're not strong already. But stay strong. Be strong. Get strong in the Lord. And have good courage. Don't let anyone back you down. Or get you, you know, to, to make excuses or be ashamed of believing in God's Word. You have no reason to be ashamed whatsoever. The people that mock you have a reason to be ashamed. But you don't. Stay strong in God's Word. Meditate in His Word day and night, and you'll have good success. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank You so much for this great wisdom and knowledge that we could learn from Your words. And so many people want to have a successful life, Lord, and, and you tell us very plainly here in the sixth book of the Bible, it's right there. If we want to have good success, we're going to meditate in your law, and we're going, to, we're going to keep them and have respect under your ways, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us, help us stir up our spirits to have a right spirit within us, renew our hearts, dear Lord, to want to serve you. Help us to actually desire and, and to view the, the reading of your word as, as something that's sweet, as something that is joyful, and then we give the right value to your words and not just uh, cast it aside as 
as something that's not that big of a deal. Lord, help us to have the, the proper respect under your commandments. And especially in a day that tries to teach us that, oh, these old commandments aren't that big of a deal. They really are, dear Lord. Help us to get the right perspective on your commandments as well as just on sin and what's right and what's wrong in general, dear Lord. Teach us. Instruct us. We love you. We want to serve you, God. And just bless everyone here tonight. In Jesus' name.